Drugs, violence, sex. All things that are quite common in film today. In the early days of film leading up to the 1930s, violence against police, violence in general, criminals being seen as anti-heroes, drug use, sex, etc. were all fairly common and pretty much accepted in film. As many of the early filmmakers came from theater, all those kinds of things were actually really common on stage. And the theater world was actually known to be quite scandalous, so a lot of that stuff carried over to film. But in the early 1920s, Hollywood was rocked by numerous scandals, such as the murder of director William Desmond Taylor and the alleged rape of Virginia Rappé by then superstar Fatty Arbuckle. And with all of this coming on the heels of the Chicago Black Sox throwing the 1919 World Series, people were sort of tired of it. And hot on the heels of the Prohibition movement, groups such as the Legion of Decency began to gain a lot of political power and demand that film be censored. Back in 1915, the United States Supreme Court presided over a case that would decide the future of film for many decades to come. Long story short, they decided that movies did not fall under the protections of free speech. And this opened the floodgates to every individual state coming up with their own version of what was considered decent. Unfortunately, no matter what you do, there's always somebody that thinks they know what's best for you. And Hollywood was having to deal with multiple different states deciding what was best for the people in their states. So instead of having to deal with all of this and having to wade through the morass that was multiple different censorship boards, the MPAA was formed, the Motion Picture Administration of America, a self-censoring board that every movie had to get the approval of. And the MPAA would be run by this man, William H. Hayes, who would actually lend his name to the code of conduct that film had to go by. It of course became known as the Hayes Code. Hayes, a Presbyterian minister and former member of President Harding's cabinet, Hayes was chosen to be the face of this new MPAA, partly to satisfy groups like the Catholic Legion of Decency. And as a lot of those who were presiding over what the Hayes Code would actually be, tended to be of a rather religious bent, what was considered moral under the Hayes Code had a very strong religious tilt to it. Essentially, nothing could ever be said bad about religion, ever. Nor could there be any bad-mouthing of police, nor seeing criminals as anti-heroes, drug use, sex, excessive violence, depictions of homosexuality, which of course were referred to as perversion under the Hayes Code. Any mention of interracial relationship was strictly forbidden, Pretty much hyper-Christian, white, racist misogynism on display. And by 1934, if you plan to make a movie, you'd better abide by it. Now, if you know anything about the Hayes Code, you know that on the surface of it, it was technically voluntary. But how did it have so much power? Now, the Hayes Code was a system of enforcement under the Production Code Association. And all of that was under the umbrella of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. And the MPPDA was made up of all of the heads of all of the major studios at the time. And they owned all the theaters in the United States. Now to further understand how the Hayes Code and the MPPDA would have so much power, we have to look at the golden age of Hollywood and a thing called the studio system. From about 1910 till 1948, Hollywood was controlled by pretty much eight studios who not only created the movies, but controlled distribution. To add to that, most of the theaters in the United States were owned by one or more of these production companies. And since nearly 80% of all movies made in the United States were coming out of these few studios, they had an enormous amount of control in what went into them. However, the studio system came to an end in 1948 with the Supreme Court decision in the United States versus Paramount Pictures. Now, because of the stranglehold that the studio system held over theaters in the United States, foreign film had been pretty much forbidden in the U.S. And with the end of the studio system from the 1948 Supreme Court decision, there was a massive influx of foreign film, including Akira Kurosawa's films, Godzilla, etc., and American audiences finally got to see them. Now, the MPAA and the Hayes Code were really only super powerful up until about 1958, with the antitrust decision that pretty much brought an end to the studio system. And then with the advent of television and the influx of foreign film, it really lost all of its teeth. And the final nail in the coffin came in 1968, when the United States Supreme Court rescinded its earlier decision from 1915 and decided that movies did in fact fall under free speech protections. 
forget to hit the like and subscribe. And if you'd like to own a piece of film history, check out my website, propstohistory.com, where many of the pieces coming out of Earl Hayes Press, the oldest prop house in the United States, are up for sale. Follow me on all the other social media platforms at Props to History. Thank you for watching. Props to History.